My next guest is uh, Mr. Uh, James H. Lattimore. Mr. Lattimore, welcome to the show here. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, it was such a pleasure meeting you the other day, and uh, I have never in my life just met a person and talked to him for five hours. <laughs> As you traveled around the world, you know, how did you, you know, your first time, you know, going overseas or going to different countries, how were you impacted emotionally and psychologically? Well, I think the primary thing is when I went through, uh, you know, these foreign countries, that the people, and I use it discreetly, the people on welfare or they're living on subsistence here in the United States are living equal to or better than 90% of the population in the countries that I got into. You know, we are so fortunate in the fact that, you know, even though uh, we have problems, but the opportunities uh, really make themselves known to you. And an old lesson I learned uh, from, used to be our old neighborhood leader, a German, said if you're willing to work hard enough and long enough, you can have or you can be anything you want to be. Do you believe that or is that just a, a oh, theory? I am a walking example of somebody that has enjoyed his life more than anybody could imagine. Now, you know, let me read something here. Because I, I have an article here uh, from, my gosh, it had to be in the 40s here, a picture of you over, looked like a radio in your Army uniform. You were a Tuskegee Airman. A Tuskegee Airman, right. Okay, it says right here, uh, it has your name, uh, James H. Lattimore, son of uh, Joseph Lattimore, um, and it has a um, well-known Negro inventor, um, and it says, today at Scott Field uh, Parent Radio School of the U.S. Army Air Force's uh, Technical Training Command. What, what, was, what is that? Well, primarily, uh, the Army or the military, you know, the government, uh, high officials had examined a few blacks and they determined that we were inferior in our mental capacities, that we uh, didn't have enough uh, knowledge or enough background, education or the like, to be useful even in the most uh, menial jobs in the military. Now, I was one of the lucky ones that I got in, and uh, I was sent to Chicago by uh, a vice president of the company that I happened to be working in for an interview. Well, this general sitting there was recruiting young blacks for the Air Force experiment. They didn't know what kind of mistake they were making because they went through the country and they hired or they uh, brought into the military uh, young, sharp uh, Negroes or blacks uh, into the Air Force and give them the toughest test that could be put together. We aced the test out generally to the point that we had one uh, military officer uh, made us take the test over again at Scottfield, Illinois, where the average uh, score before then was like 85. After we took it the second time, the minimal score was about 90 to 95. Now we had gained because in a test generally there's a trick question or two. Well, if you take a test a second time, you know what that quick, quick question is built like. So it makes you get a little bit higher score. But we made them, uh, a couple of these officers that didn't want us in the Air Force to begin with and was going to make life tough for us, our grades were so high in these scores that they didn't know what to do with us. And the group that I was, that uh, went to school in special communication and radar, they needed 40. They sent 100, expecting the balance of them to, you know, to fail. Our graduating class, they'd sent 100, but we graduated 98 with a score equal to or better than uh, 95. Now. The only thing we had with these two, one had an incurable ulcer of sorts, and the other had some, some medical reason, but I'm not sure what it was that. But everyone else passed. And we built, among us young guys, because I was <laughs> a kid, uh, we built within ourselves, we were not going to let these people you know, make us look bad. 
If we had one student that uh, needed a little extra help, we had two or three teachers or mentors in our group that would spend the night in a latrine with a small light or candle to give them the additional work they needed to get that score. We did not accept somebody failing in our, in our group. What gave you all the insight to know the importance of you all doing well at the time? Because sometimes today people will do anything that they can do to get an edge on the next guy, but yet you guys were sticking out the arm of help to each other. Well, I don't know that it's very easy. It's just it's a natural thing among the young guys that were, uh, that were recruited. Like one of my running buddies, uh, his family lived in uh, in Kansas. At 10 years old, he was uh, flying a Piper Cub as a crop duster back in his family farm because his family were crop dusters in Kansas. Everybody in his family flew a, a small aircraft that would kill the bugs and you know, plant the seeds and the fertilizer. This is a black guy. A black guy, a black family. And then, uh, oh, we we had guys... Uh, like in our group, we had somebody that was good or better than the best in whatever it was we tried. If we wanted to do something, we always had somebody that knew enough about it that they could ha have at it. But we had pride because we knew we were an experiment, and that's about all we knew. You know, we didn't have any of the details of the you know, percentages and the rest of it, but we knew that we had the opportunity to do what we could, you know, to show off what we could do. We were the biggest bunch of show offs there wanted to, you know, wanted to see. We won the military uh, marching uh, um, trophy because our drill team developed, like a drill sergeant developed a program where he would give us maybe 10 or 12 commands. The whole group as a uh, marching group would follow through and uh, produce these various uh, patterns of march, the various positions and whatnot, all in sequence without a caller. But nobody was there calling you know, the next step to what we do. We knew the program so well as we marched, it was just like you had them all tied together and everybody had his exact spot and they weren't a half a, half a step out of, out of the way. So we knocked off all the prizes. When we got into that, into the schools, I don't know how to, how to put it. When we got into the schools, everybody had the idea that we were going to make the best of it because we could get the best education for the least amount of money that you could get. You know, when they send you to the uh, Air Force Special Communications School, there's no better school in communication because they pick the best teachers, the best instructors in the United States to teach us. Well, you know, as I was reading this article here, it says that to a large extent you were self-educated. How, how were you well, self... <laughs> it's, uh, the article is a little bit askew. Uh, I grew up in a neighborhood, McCulloch Street in, in the Fort Wayne area, where there all of the fathers were scientists or engineers. Director of R&D at the International Harvester Company, director of uh, uh, small motors and transformers of General Electric Company, <laughs> Uh, Phillips Dodge, who made the wire, uh, and then there was Phillips Dodge, Essex Wire, uh, the Dedlow, the Bass Foundry. I had a chance to see fathers in my neighborhood were involved in engineering and whatnot of these various companies. They take the kids in the neighborhood, and when you got to be seven or eight years old, you could lay around uh, the park or the uh, the community because the customs of the people in that neighborhood was that you would learn enough skills to provide a good living for your family before you do anything else. So it was kind of structured. If you can imagine now a kid uh, seven years old going to Charlie Durig to learn sheet metal uh, production, you know, uh, putting on st uh, steeples, buildings, roofs, making kettles and all kinds of stuff uh, out of sheet metal. Well, the first thing, like the neighbor uh, commander or <laughs> Brawlmeister that lived across the street from us, 
One Sunday morning, my dad, my uh, sister, and myself were sitting on the front porch reading the comics. Papa Dozier lived across the street. He hollered over to my dad, and he said, Joe, the boy is wasting his time. Tomorrow morning, take him up to Charlie Duray. Now, nobody asked Charlie Duray if he wanted another apprentice. Nobody asked me if I wanted to learn to be a sheet metal mechanic. But then my dad, Monday morning, my dad took me up to Charlie Drigg's uh, shop. Charlie Drigg opened the door to the big shop. Adolf, here's your new apprentice. Nobody asked Adolf if he wanted a new apprentice. But then within a year, I was making uh, measuring cups for the guys that had a few beers to drink. We made uh, uh, coal oil uh, cans to carry the wick or the coal oil for the lamps and the stuff around it. Neighborhood, uh, the milk, uh, measuring that, you know, pints and quarts of milk, all made out of scrap tin. Now that's because these old, old Germans, uh, they would teach you the tricks to the trade. So, you know, during this time, now you were still eight years old, seven years old at this time period? Yes. So, at, at, at what age <clears throat> were you when you first started experimenting with radios and, 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 uh, uh, electrical, uh, electronic well, components. Was before I was, I would say when I was five or six. It was because it was there to be done, and my dad had all of the radio equipment and stuff back, you know, in the back part of the house, where he did repair on electrical equipment and that kind of stuff. And so the tools, the equipment, uh, something that was broken was left to throw to take to the dump. I was the first place at the dump. I take it apart. Uh, find out what was wrong with it, try to repair it, and many times repaired it, and it worked for three or four days. But it was, you know, it led me in the right directions. So, but at, at what point did you know that you had an aptitude uh, for an engineering direction? Uh, I'm not real sure. But I think the first time that I realized that, uh, that I had something that was, uh, was fun and it was going to be a, a value to me, was when I was asked or got to uh, talking with Bob Seavers with one of the radio engineers from the old Fort Wayne station, WOWO. They needed somebody uh, as a grunt uh, in their uh, broadcasting team uh, that would set up the microphones and pull the wires and do the odds and ends uh, at the uh, recording studio in Chicago. Then I felt that, you know, hey, well, I got something because I did it. It wasn't hard. I could do it easily. I was got to be pretty good at it. And the people that I was associated with uh, would give me all the encouragement and give me projects and allow me to uh, uh, go to the public library engineering section when the special library card where kids weren't allowed in there. I was. And I was given projects to work on. It required work in the senior, the senior level. And to me, that was fun. I mean, here I am, a kid, and I'm not good in athletics and, uh, or singing or anything like that. But boy, when it came to uh, designing something, engineering-wise, understanding something, it was the easiest thing in the world for me. And I could have more fun than anybody. Now, you, know, <coughs> you mentioned a story about you and one of your teachers, a little trick, I guess, that you played on a teacher when she walked by. Well, no, I didn't play that. I didn't do it on purpose. We had, uh, let's see, it was at Harmer Gray School. They had their uh, open house for the parents and the teachers coming in to meet everybody and whatnot. And we had an electrical department here at Central or at uh, Harmer that started you in in the basic electric, uh, electrical sciences. Well, one of the projects that I had worked on was a Tesla coil. It's where the bottom half of the coil or bottom layer of it is about as big around as this desk. The top half was about uh, six inches in diameter. And when you powered it up and let it run, you could get sparks that were two foot long. And in order to use it, we had two layers of Coca-Cola bottles. See, the first layer was put on the ground and they were all sticking up. The second layer, we put a board in and we put another layer of bottle. That's to insulate the electrical energy that we were generating in these coils from going to ground. It just so happened, uh, a person with uh, 
uh, hair, <laughs> I started to say long hair, but per just persons with hair would walk near this Tesla coil, and you'd take a wand and go between the Tesla coil and that person. You could pick a spark up off of the Tesla coil and carry it through the air at the tip of this wand, and then it would cause the hair on her head to stand straight up. Well, I had a teacher, a mathematics teacher. She was a nice teacher, but she was devilish. And I, when I say devilish, uh, she found it easy to share in a practical joke on another teacher or another student or something of the kind. Found out that if you got near that Tesla coil and held the wand at a certain place in the back, you could make the hair stand up on her head. Didn't realize it would also raise a wig right straight up. Now, if you can imagine this teacher, she must have been in her mid-30s because I was, you know, like 10 or 12 or so. But as she walked through there, I saw the edge of that wig raise up. So I got extra, extra devilish. I kicked up the power on my Tesla coil. As she walked by, I got this wig in the uh, guiles of this Tesla coil. And as she walked off the stage, the wig didn't. <laughs> and if you can imagine, I mean, she was ready to commit murder, but she looked at it and everybody was laughing so much, she got to laughing, and so it became a big joke, you know, that part of it. But then when I get to class, she told me that I was going to have to do uh, two or three more projects to get her uh, approval of what I was going to be doing next. She wasn't going to punish me, but I just had to do two or three projects to pay for what I did. But that was kind of the kind of stuff that I got into. There was a working buddy whose family, the Latts, used to own, or that maybe still do, well, WMD department store. Mm -hmm. Bill Latts and I were uh, were lab partners in the science science lab. We were studying physics. Now, on here in Clinton Street, they had, they built a new facility right behind the gymnasium. And they had the lab on the second floor. Bill uh, Latz and I were working in a lab, and we made the mistake of mixing two chemicals that generated gigantic amounts of white smoke. We had these two jars setting in there, and it got away from us. So we, smart guys, we set the jars up on a desk underneath the exhaust fan. Within 10 minutes, you couldn't see across Clinton Street. Traffic came to a screeching halt at noon hour. Traffic came to a screeching halt. Police department, fire department, everybody else was looking, trying to find the trouble. Bill Latz and I were sitting up there <laughs> in the lab, wondering where all the smoke was going. But we were punished for stop, not for what we did, but for jamming up traffic where it took them all afternoon to get things squared around to correct what we had done. You know, but having all this ability as 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 a young kid, you know, how did you harness that, and and, and what did that ability take you in life? What did you do with well, it? Well, uh, it wasn't. How can I put it? Uh, I didn't have to figure out what to do with it because these old uh, German neighbors of mine found places for me to use up that energy, like uh, for the guys that. Uh, yeah, that built General Electric's new dynamometer building over on uh, uh, Calhoun, no, Fairfield and Taylor. They built a dynamometer, uh, dynamometer building in there that's completely isolated from the ground. They had railroad car springs underneath, and the building inside was built to do it. Now, the engineers would be running a test, and in every 20 or 30 seconds, you had to write down the values that you see there. I'm lazy. I don't like to write them down, and it's difficult to uh, to correctly evaluate the number because if you move your head this way, it's going to be plus or minus 5% or 10% on that side. Or if you move your head this way just a wee bit, your values can be you know, 3 to 5% off. That was no good. Uh, I wanted more accuracy. My dad had just finished a course in Chicago with the teletype people in order to maintain the teletype machines at the newspaper. Well, I was able to take uh, the teletype machine and use the paper tape 
as a recorder, but then I got uh, stepper relays from the telephone company, which were tin discs stacked above one another. And then the controller, each disc uh, would drop down, you know, the fingers would drop down disc by disc by disc. So I could take set a uh, matrix at 10 volts. Okay, now at 9 volts, I'd have another special little resistor, 8 volts, 7, 6, 5, you know, and so on. Now, when you compared, I uh, used the stepper motors, and you, you compared two voltages, the one that you're producing and the one that you're measuring. Now, as you take those measurements, uh, if it's greater than, you can do one thing with the signal. Or if it's less than, you can do something else with it. So it's e equal to greater than or less than, mm -hmm. then it would move down to the next step. And these relays would juggle on down. So you could get an accuracy of three to five decimal places. Well, if I set this up to record uh, the heat loss or the temperature loss on a motor, 150 horsepower motor that they were testing, I could put my sensors inside of that test room and then the teletype machine every 10 seconds would take a, a reading and it would punch it out on the tape. And when it was all done, we'd take that tape over to a telephone connection with, a, with the next teletype machine and send it to Chicago for analysis. Then they would, they, sometime the next day or two, send you mm -hmm. back a report on the values. They liked that fifth decimal place accuracy. And so I got to be, uh, <coughs> I was given the keys and was able to, you know, to play all I wanted to play. Well, that gave me an understanding of Boolean, of Boolean algebra, uh, you know, binary arithmetic, to be able to utilize to make the teletype machine tell me what I wanted to know. Got to learn to that. Then every the whole world sort of kind of opened up or unzipped the cover, and now I understood a lot more about a lot of different things because it was simple Boolean algebra. But you know, you know, we only have a few, a few minutes left. You know, where have you worked in the world? Well, we have about uh, four or five minutes left here. Okay, I started out, and my first major job uh, was with uh, well Wayne Tank and Pump Company, and this was before the war, and they were making uh, shells for uh, like a hundred millimeter cannon. They were having a difficult time in making enough of these copper rings to supply their needs. What I was able to do was to design an electrical device where one girl could produce what 16 girls had to do before. This was into the end of the war effort. And then, uh, oh, it's... But, so you did design work to help companies save money. Right. You know, as you, were you ever afraid to do these experiments? Because when you, when you do experiments, that means that you can fail. Right. Well, see, that's what Papa, Papa Dozier, the old German uh, meister of the neighborhood, taught me. When you're doing an experiment, you never set yourself up to fail. You may have had an error that gave you a number that was outside the range that you wanted to be in, but you never had the wrong one. You know, say that uh, you were running an experiment and it, and it literally failed. It didn't. The conditions that you tried were off to one side or the other that, that made your experiment uh, so that you had to, to change the values and do it again. That way, there was never this thing of, you know, we were taught, there was never this thing of failure. You didn't fail. You just made a uh, mistake in the variables that you chose to examine. And, you know, I said we're winding down, but I have to ask you this here. You mentioned to me that, you know, you know we, when we were talking, um, a lot of uh, blacks, let's say from the South, or who were in the South, any time a white person came down the sidewalk, you either had to get off the sidewalk or, or get out of their way. But I understand that one time, I guess you did get off the sidewalk, but when the guy walked by, he spit on you. No, I didn't get off the sidewalk. You're referring to the time my first leave at uh, Tuskegee Institute at Tuskegee, Alabama, I'd been off base, I'd come back and was standing waiting for the bus to take us to, on the base. This guy didn't like the fact that I was maybe taller than him, that I was in uniform, walked over and spit in my face. I'd been raised in this old German Lutheran community 
that are around McCulloch Street, and here, if anybody hit you, swung at you, or spit on you, they were supposed to be hurt. And all I did was use a particular uh, step over push motion that I flipped the guy over and I, I I gave him the very polite instruction that I wasn't to be spit on, I wasn't to be disrespected, and that he was going to hurt for a while. Well, a knee okay. or a shoe to the right place, kaput. So, Mr. Nanamore, you know, while we were running down here, you know, uh, other stories I found out was that if when you did that in the South, uh, you get hung for that kind of thing, right. but I guess your army, your army buddy saved you from that incident. Well, what they did is they put me on the, on the bus, took me back to base, signed me up and sent me to uh, um, Scottfield, Illinois, because I was being scheduled, I was going to be scheduled soon, because my qualifications had said that I could go to this okay. top flight. You know, I didn't mean to cut you off. You know, what we're going to have to do is, is uh, okay, well, you're 88 years old. You're traveling still everywhere. Uh, I know you have to go back to the Detroit area pretty soon. You, we got to come back here and do another show here at some point in time because there's so much I want to talk with you about. And, and uh, do you have a book written yet yourself? No. I've had a number of people, uh, well. you might say, bug me about it because of the story. Okay. But... Uh, Mr. Lattimore, you know, they're, they're, they're t telling us off. You know, I don't know if we still have audio here, but I'm glad you all watched the show. Hope you got something out of it. Good night, and God bless you.